Praise the Lord. Christ in you, dear friend. I thank God for what he has done for us and this far that he has brought us. And I trust that you are doing very well. God, the grace of God is still in favor of us. Amen. The last time we, we came your way with the Holistic Empowerment Series of Pensa Greater Accra Sector, I spoke about God deserves better. The time is now. God deserves better. The time is now. And we read from the book of Haggai, chapter 1, from the verse 1 to 4. And God, through the prophet Haggai, admonished and rebuked the people of Israel that God had redeemed them from Babylon to come and build or rebuild his temple. But when they came, out of one reason or the other, the people did not do it. When they started, they go to, after the foundation, they didn't continue. And their excuse was that, it was not time to build the temple of God. But while it was not time, according to them, to build the temple of God, they were busy building their paneled houses. And God expected them to build his temple and they were not doing it. So God, through the prophet Haggai, came to speak to them and said that, my people say that it is not time to build my house. My house. But they are building their paneled houses. They were not building ordinary houses but they were building their house, the best houses of the time. Because panel houses at that time were built by kings. They were built by kings. If you remember, the kind of house, the kind of palace that King Solomon built was a panel house. But these people were giving the excuses that it was not time to build the temple of God. And the temple of God lied or laid in ruins while they pursued their own buildings and built their best. And God, through the prophet Haggai, came to speak to them. Now, today, what we want to continue, or where we want to continue from, is from the verse 11. I mean, from the verse 5 to the verse 11. And the topic we are considering today, sequel to what we presented at that time, is God deserves the best, consider your ways. God deserves the best, consider your ways. So we read from Haggai chapter 1. From the verse 5 to 11, from the New King James Version, Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. Now therefore, that says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. That said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew. The earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, and the oil on whatever the ground brings forth, on men, on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Hallelujah. So as we're saying, God redeemed them from Babylon. God gave them, uh, he gave them favor in the sight of King Cyrus, who we talked about last week that God through the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah had prophesied that through him the people were going to redeem from Babylon. And through the word of God it came to pass that Cyrus came and released them to go and build the temple of God. And he even gave them the materials they needed. The materials they needed. As if that was, what, that was not enough, even the Babylonians who were supposed to be their enemies, also at that point, they, they, the people gave their favor and they also added more materials to them to go and build 
temple of God. Now, when they came, that was when they came to give the excuse that no, 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 no. It is not time to build the temple of God. The time of God, the time to build the temple of God will come. Now it is time to build our own houses, the best houses of our time. The second admonition that the prophet Haggai gave them was that after he exhorted them to go and build the temple, he told them to consider their ways. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Now, the word consider means that to give a careful thought to something. He was admonishing them to give a careful thought to their previous life and their current life. Because they were not doing what God expected them to do, there had been a change in their life. It was time for the people to do serious examination of themselves before the law. And they were to examine their, their, their lifestyle and themselves in the light of the covenant that they had made with God. Consider your ways. Consider your previous life. And consider your current life. Consider when you used to do the will of God. And consider your current life where you are not doing what God expects you to do. Consider your life, your lifestyle, consider your present condition in the light of God's covenant he has made with you. Now, if you look at the people of Israel, God had made a covenant with them and it was clearly stated. They knew it. They knew it. Even at the time God was going to redeem them from Egypt. And God made a covenant with them that if they should obey him, he was going to do certain things for them, for them, but if they disobeyed him, there was other thing that God was going to do. And so God had made a covenant with them. Let's read some excerpts from Leviticus chapter 26. Now from Leviticus chapter 26, let me read some excerpts from the verse 3. God told the people that if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in this season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down. And none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemy shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look on you favorably, and make you fruitful, multiply you. Confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old habits and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. So, God had told them these things that I am going to redeem you from Egypt, even from the time of Egypt. This was what he told them. If you obey my statutes, if you obey my commandments, then I am the Lord your God who am going to do all these things for you. I'm going to cause rain to fall in this season. And the land shall yield its fruits. The trees shall also yield their, their fruits. And you shall have your produce. I mean, you will not lack. You will not lack. And I will cause your enemy to also flee before you. So they were aware of all these things. But that was not all. There was a condition. The condition. Or there was the other side of the covenant. This is, if you obey my commandment, this is what I will do to you. But on the other hand, let's read from the verse 14. It says that, but if you do not obey me, and do not observe all these commandments. And if you despise my statutes, or if your 
so abhors my judgment, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant. You see, break my covenant. So they tell, this tells us that God had made a covenant with them. And as I have been telling you always, as for God, he is not man that you should lie. So for his part of the covenant, we are very much assured that he is going to fulfill it. In fact, he has made his part of the covenant available. We should rather fulfill our part of the covenant so that we plunge into his part of the covenant, which is already available. So God says that if you despise my statutes and abhor my judgment and go contrary to my commandments and break my covenant, verse 16, I also will do this. I also will do this. So God acting in this way is dependent on how we behave towards him. But he has already cautioned us. Or he has already Warn us. Warn us. I will also do this. I will even appoint terror over you. Hmm. Wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of us. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Verse 19. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Let me jump to verse 26. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. And they shall break back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. This is strange. This is strange. God says that if you don't do what I expect you to do, if you don't change your ways, if you don't consider your ways and change and give me the best and do what I expect you to do, he had told them earlier in his word that he was going to break the pride of their power. And he says that, and you shall sow, and you, uh, and you shall sow your seed in vain. Your seed will be sown in vain. I will make your heavens like iron. Heaven like iron. Which means that God is going to withhold rain. Like an iron has blocked the heavens that no rain can penetrate and fall to the ground. And your earth like bronze. Metals. So, metal blocking rings and metal blocking the earth. So, even if you sow something, you don't even have rain for it to, 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 I mean, to germinate and yield its fruit. And the, the earth you had made like a, a, a bronze metal. What can you sow? What can you cultivate and yield the best fruit that you desire? Your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then he says that a time will come that I will cut off the supply of your bread. Ten women are going to bake your bread. You, one person, the bread you want to eat, your breakfast, should be, it will be so big that one woman cannot bake that bread, cannot carry that bread and bake it. So ten women will have to come together and bake the bread that you have to eat. So they will come, they will bring it, a heavy bread, a bread with weight, and you will be able to eat all of them, still you will not be satisfied. That is serious. That is serious. May the Lord have mercy on us. And exactly, exactly true to the word of God, if you look at what the prophet Haggai told them, what he told them to consider their ways. Let's read from the verse 6 of Haggai chapter 1. You have sown much and bring in little. The word of God is coming to pass because the people had refused to do what he had told them to do. Because they had broken their part of the covenant.
covenant. And so the word of God had to be fulfilled. So you have sown much by bringing little. You can work hard and work hard and work hard. Turn the land, cultivate the land. So cultivate large acres of land. But what you bring home will be little. You eat, but you do not have enough. Or you eat, but you are not satisfied. Now you are sowing and getting little, but you are also eating too much. Because of not making God happy. So you eat too much, but still no amount of food would you eat and be satisfied. You drink. You can drink all kinds of drink, but you will not be satisfied. Sometimes you you be wish that you drink and you get intoxicated so that you can you can lose your, your consciousness so that you can forget about some of your predicaments. But the God, um, the God says that you will drink and drink and drink and drink and drink and drink and drink, but you will not get intoxicated. Because I, the Lord, I have caused it. You feel cold. You pile up a lot of clothes so that you feel warm. But God says that you clothe yourself, but no one is warm. No matter the, 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 the quantity of clothes that you put on yourself or you wear, you will not get warm. Then he says that he who earned wages, earned wages to put in a bag with holes under it. When you are not doing what God expects you to do, when you are not making time for God and you want to make time for yourself, because of business, because of money, people don't have time for God. They have time for their businesses. They have time to make money. As for the money, you will make it. But God says that you will earn the wages, but the wages will be like money put in the bags with holes under them. So as you walk around, you think that you have made enough money, but as you walk around, your bar, there is a big hole under it. So all the monies will be falling. By the time you get home, you didn't know where the money went to or how you lost the money. Hallelujah. That says the Lord of hosts. Now consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. You look for much. But indeed, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. I blew it away. So you can decide not to make time for God and make time for your own things. You can decide to sideline the things of God and pursue your own things. But when you have gone and worked hard and have brought it home, because you don't give God the best, God says that I blow it away. So sometimes you wonder, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm not lazy. I'm doing a lot of things. I'm working hard. But I don't know what I'm using my money for. I get money, but I don't know what happens. Then the money vanishes. Consider your ways. God is telling us, consider your ways. How much time have you given to God as compared to the time you have given to your business? How much time have you given to God as compared to the time you have given to your academics? How much time have you given to God as compared to the time you are giving to your relationship? Consider your ways. Because we cannot sideline God and succeed in the things that we do. May the Lord have mercy on us and may he help us. Hallelujah. God expects us to glorify him. And so in the verse 8, he told them, go out to the mountains. When he had told them to consider their ways, he told them, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. When we do the things that God has told us to do, when we do the things that God expects us to do, he takes pleasure in it, he takes delight in it, and he is glorified by them. He is glorified by them. So God told them, consider your ways. If you want me to be your God once again, then you must consider your ways. You would rather go up to the mountains and go and bring wood and build a temple. And build a temple. Go and bring wood. Now, when the temple was built by the Babylonians, fortunately, the concrete works were not destroyed. It was only the wood work that were destroyed. So they were supposed to go and bring wood so that they will come and reconstruct the wooden aspect of 
of it and refurnish the temple of God and to be complete. And this, they say that, no, the concrete, the bronze, they were still usable. They could use it again to rebuild the temple of God. But they said, it was not time. It was not time. Then Haggai commanded them that go and bring timber and repair the, and rebuild the temple of God. When we obey God, God takes delight in his people. When we obey God, he takes delight in his people. And his name is glorified when we serve him. The God who has called us, the God who made you and I, expects us to make him proud. He expects us to make him happy. He expects us to serve him. He needs our companionship. But we are drifting far away from him. May we draw closer unto him and may he take delight in us. It did not please God when the people who were supposed to honor his name had neglected God's house and were building their own houses. Beloved, when God speaks to us, when God speaks to us, when God commands us through his word, or even by your personal encounter with him, what he has told you, you don't have any other response but to obey. Yes. When God tells you that there is something, when you are convinced through the word of God and by what he has told you in your closet, you don't have any option but to obey him. So God requires total obedience from us and nothing more, nothing less. When God speaks to us, we don't have to weigh the options. In fact, we shouldn't have an option. When God speaks to us, we don't have to examine the alternatives. When God speaks to us, we don't have to negotiate the terms. We simply do what God tells us and leave the rest with him. Even in the military, they tell you that do before complain. Even in the human institution of military. When your superior gives a command, at that point that the command has been given, you can't go to your superior and tell him that, Sir, Sir, I think that we can do this. No, you dare not. You dare not. But sometimes we take God for granted. And when God has spoken to us clearly, clearly, and he has given us a certain course to follow, the way to go, and we, 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 we want to negotiate that. Th what terms? What terms? God expects total obedience from us. So you do it, you do what he has told you to do, and then you leave the rest for him. Now, one British preacher by name Geoffrey Stardust Kennedy has said that faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. It is obeying in spite of consequence. It is obeying in spite of consequence. Now, when, when there is the clear evidence that when you do this, this is what you gain from it. Then you go and do it. That is not faith. The faith is obeying God in spite of the consequence. In spite of the consequence. Sometimes you may not even know the outcome. Like God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He told him, leave your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your father's house. And go to a land I will show you. I will make your name great. And you will be blessed. And the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Now, God has spoken this to Abraham. But you see, if it were you and I, what would you have done? God, you said I should go. Why should I go? But Abraham did not question God. Because he trusted in the one who had spoken to him. Even at that time, Abraham was an idolater. Hallelujah. But you and I, who have been privileged to be Christians at that time, when God speaks to us, how obedient are we to his word? 
But because Abraham obeyed, even in spite of the consequence, because he said, I should leave my country, I should leave my father's house, I should leave my family, and go to a land I will show you. Security. Future security. Where should I go? I don't know where I'm supposed to go. You have not told me where I'm supposed to go. Then you just say, I should go. But because of the one who spoke it, your obedience to God determines the faith you have in him. Your obedience to the word of God determines the trust that you have for him. If you don't obey the word of God, it means that you don't trust God again. That is by implication. You don't trust him. And so, you want to negotiate God. So God, you say I should go. Why, why, why should I go? Why, why do I go there? What, what will I get? What will I gain from it? What you gain from it is what you will be requesting. May the Lord help us that we will be able to obey what God has spoken to us and what God expects us to do. Now, eventually, when the people obeyed God, God rekindled the spirit, uh, the, the, the spirit of Zerubbabel and they decided to rise up and go to the mountains and get him back and come and build the temple of God. Then, God, through the prophet Isaiah um, Haggai, assured them that I am with you. I am with you. When they obeyed God, the prophet assured them that God was with them in all their endeavors. So Haggai chapter 1 verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. When you obey the commands of God, even in spite of consequence, even in spite of what you don't know will be the outcome, we are assured of the presence of God. He will not leave us. So let us obey him. Let us give him the best that he requires from us. And he will not leave us along the way. He will be with us. He will be with us. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 21, Jesus told the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. I mean, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When God gives you a command, when God gives you an instruction, when you don't even know how it is going to end, how it's going to go, God will be assured of his presence any time we obey his command and any time we do what pleases him and what he expects us to do. So, beloved, beloved, God's presence cannot be questioned when we obey his statutes, his commands, and what he expects us to do. When we please God, he makes even our perceived enemies to be at peace with us. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The people that you perceive to be your enemies, when you do the things that God expects us to expect you to do, and you do things that please God, the Bible says that he even makes your enemies, your perceived enemies, to be at peace with you. And we saw it in Haggai. When God was redeeming them from Babylon by giving them favor in the sight of King Cyrus, when King Cyrus had given them the, 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 the material they needed to go and build the temple, the Babylonians who were their perceived enemies, the people who were intimidating them, when it was time for them to go, they also gave them some more materials. They gave them some more materials. Why don't we do things that will please the Lord? When we do that, even the people who are perceived to be our enemies, God through them will be a blessing unto us. Hallelujah. Then I want to admonish us that do not forget your first love. Consider your ways. When God was telling them to consider their ways, he was telling them that how they used to love him, they should revisit it. So as believers, I want to admonish all of us that do not forget your first love. As the word of God came to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, the Bible says that to the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, These things say the Lord who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walked in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works. 
your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them lies. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your last stand from its place, unless you repent. So God was acknowledging all the things that the church in Ephesus, the, the, the relationship they had with him, and how they had worked for him, and they had persevered for him. God was acknowledging all that. Yes. God acknowledges the things that you have done for him. When you came to Christ, in the early days of your Christian life, the zeal, the commitment, the passion, the way you used to do things for God, your commitment to God, is it the same as today? Is it the same as today? So God acknowledges all that. But God doesn't want you to be complacent and begin to lose God and begin to lose things now. But God says that, I have this against you. You have forgotten of your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. So the things that you were doing for God, the kind of relationship that you had with God, that now you, 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 you assess yourself, you examine yourself, and you see that you are no more doing it. God is telling us to go back and revisit them and do the things that we used to do. Remember the height from which you are fallen and repent and do the things that you used to do at first. Else, like he told the Israelites, now, if you do these things for me, I'll bless you, I'll do this, I'll give the rain in each season and all that. You shall, the land will use its fruits, the tree will use its fruits and all that. But if you disobey me, if you disobey me, in the same way it, it tells us here, else I come quickly and remove your last stand, your lamp stand from its place, unless you repent. If you're a Christian, if you are not very careful, you gradually get to a place of declaration. Because when you are losing your God as a believer, it doesn't come at once. It is gradual. It is gradual. The things that you used to do, you begin to lose them one after the other. You begin to lose them. One when you are on the verge of backsliding or you are on the route to backsliding, the things you lose them one after the other gradually. You don't just stop at once. May the Lord have mercy on us. God is telling us not to forget our first love. When God tells us not to forget our first love, what it means is that he wants us to retain the strong and ardent affection that we used to have for him. The regard and the respect we used to have for the things of God when we came to Christ. In the early stages of our Christian life, the things that we used to do. Again, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves to see if we are still in the faith. The prophet Haggai told them, consider your ways. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. Test yourself. Nobody will test you. We should examine ourselves daily to see whether we are in the faith. We need to do that. We need to consider our ways. Compare the days where we used to do the things that God, or the things that please God. Compared to now. Compared to now. Many people if you are not very careful, we'll be drifting away from Christ. Because, yes, it's true. Because we live in the last days. And Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 and 13, Bible says that, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But they that endure to the end shall be saved. The things of this world are causing us to fall away. 
But we must be on our guard. We must be vigilant. Iniquity, bribery, and corruption everywhere. That if you're not very careful, you are a Christian, you'll be in an office, you'll be in your office, but there's, there's a subtle way of taking bribes. Somebody comes to your office, and if the person doesn't tip you, 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 you don't do what you're expected to do. You're expecting tips. Don't you take your salary? If somebody blesses you, that is fine. But if you want to, based on uh, someone who has been given tips, and when that person comes, you give that person special favors, it is a subtle way of corruption. It's a subtle way of corruption. We need to be conscious of ourselves and do what God expects us to do. Examine yourself if you are still in the faith. I want to quickly give some few parameters that we can use to examine ourselves if you are still in the faith. The first one is, how is your relationship with God? Do you have a strong desire to spend time with Him? Do you have a strong hunger for the Word of God? Do you make time for private prayer? Do you crave for human companionship more than relationship with Christ? Do you spend more time and effort on your physical appearance more than cultivating the inner spiritual beauty that pleases Christ? Consider your ways. Examine yourself to see if you are still in the faith. If you are still in the faith. What do you talk about? What assurances do you make? Do you gossip and backbite rather than encouraging and exhorting people? Do you enjoy having fellowship with other Christians or you are losing the fellowship of the brethren and so you don't take delight even in going to church again? Now when it is Sunday or it's time for you to go to church, the love, the zeal, the enthusiasm for you to go to church, it is waning. Is that how it is? Examine yourself if you are still in the faith. What will people say about you? Will people say you walk in the light or you are walking in darkness? Whatever you do, the things that you think that um, the things that you think you are doing in secret, somebody sees it. Sometimes you do it with certain people, and you have connived. That all, I mean, you have come together to condone and connive and do certain things. One day, one day, one day, one day, one of you or one of them will come out. So the things that you are doing with people and you think that you are hiding it, one day, one day it will come out. But even if it doesn't come out, the God we serve, He is an omniscient God. He is an omniscient God who knows everything. May the Lord help us. Are you obedient to the word of God? Do you love the things of this world? Bible tells us, do not love the world or the things of this world. If nobody loves the world or the things of the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. Do you love the things of this world? So you are following after material things. You are craving and clamoring things for yourself. Do you have a pure motive for what you do? We are examining ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Do you demonstrate love for other Christians? Do you walk your talk? What do you do in your anger? Anger in itself is not sinful. But what you do in your anger is what is key here. Bible says that. Be angry, but do not sin. And do not let, less, do not let the sun go down on your anger. How do you deal with sin? Compared to the days when you came to Christ, now how do you deal with sin? Are you slow to respond to the conviction of sin or you ignore it altogether? When you are convicted of sin, are you slow to respond to it? Do you enjoy certain sins and want to justify them? Oh, ask for this one there. It is the order of the day. Oh, ask for this one there. Oh, Christians, oh, I mean, ask for this one there. Ask for this one there. So now, the thing that you used to criticize, now gradually you are justifying them. Examine yourself to see if you are still in the faith. Bible tells us, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Do not.
not forget of your first love. Else I will come quickly and remove the love stand from its place. May the Lord have mercy on us. Are you quick to judge other people of their sins and ignore your own sins? You are quick to judge other people, but you alone, you, you, you know what you do in your privacy. Bible tells us, remove the log on your eyes first before you can remove that of the speck. You have a log on your eye, you, 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 you don't see the log, but you have been able to see the speck on somebody's eye. If you are talking about the speck, you are, there's a log on your eye. How do you control your sexual appetite? How do you control your sexual appetite? Do you abstain or you indulge yourself in certain sexual practices? How do you control your sexual appetite? If you are not married as Christians, abstinence is our watchword. If you are married, fidelity is our watchword. How do you control your sexual appetite? As young people, Sometimes, okay, then we will not involve ourselves in sexual intercourse, but we will involve ourselves in masturbation. As for that one, I have not had sexual intercourse. How do you control your sexual appetite? Do you really give sacrificially in support of God's work? Do you really give sacrificially in support of God's work? How willing are you to give in support of God's work. And finally, are you fond of always criticizing almost everything done in the church? A Christian, brother, a Christian, sister, a deacon, elder, pastor, are you fond of always criticizing almost everything in the church? If you are used to doing that, then consider your ways because you cannot now find anything good in the church. You have to be very careful. Examine yourself if you are still in the faith. You are drifting away. You are drifting away. You are becoming a dual trophy in the church. And such people are dangerous. You are becoming a dangerous being in the church. And God does not take delight in such people. May the Lord have mercy on us. Do not forget of your first love. God deserves the best. Consider your ways to see if you are giving him the best. To conclude, I want to say that it is always necessary to consider our ways before God to see whether we are doing what God has told us and expect of us. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 tells us, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Sometimes we want to champion our own course rather than championing the course of Christ. When that happens, God can allow certain bad things to happen to us just to draw our attention to something he wants us to do but we have refused to do. So what God did to the Israelites, as the prophet Haggai told us, was to let them consider their ways and know that when they were doing what he was expecting them to do, he was blessing them. But because they had refused to do what he expected them to do, that was, what, that, that was why he brought those action on them. So sometimes when God is speaking to you, you refuse to hear. You refuse to listen. He has spoken to you. You are convicted, but you are giving excuses. You are refusing. You are postponing it. Then God can cause certain things to happen to us. Not to destroy you, but to, to draw your attention that I am still the God and your life is in my hands. And everything that belongs to you belongs to me as well. Just to draw your attention. To make you conscious of yourself that he is the God who has made us. We must therefore consider our ways to see if we are really giving him the best. And he will continually glorify himself in us. Our God deserves the best. And so we need to consider our ways if you are not giving him the best, we must change, repent, and give him the best. And God will continue to bless us and prove himself to be our God. May the Lord be with us. May the Lord help us. And may he cause us to be able to give him the best 
that he deserves from us. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. God will you bless you for listening to us. I pray that the hand of God touches you as you have, you have listened to this message. That whatever way you are not doing things right to give God the best, God will cause you to be able to do what he expects from you. Shall we pray? We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your word that has come unto us. We pray in the name of Jesus and come before you. Your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, if in one way or the other we have been disobedient unto your word, we pray, O oh God, at this point, the Lord have mercy on us in the name of Jesus. And we pray that from now on, help us to be able to do what you require from us and to give you the best that you deserve. I pray for my brothers and sisters who even do not know you, that God cause them to give their life unto you in the name of our Lord Jesus. We thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen. God which bless you. Hope to see you once again on Sunday with another edition of the Holistic Empowerment Series brought to you by Pensa Greater Accra Sector. God bless you. See you then. Bye-bye.